A few months ago, I was given a jar of magnesium supplements, which promised more energy and better sleep. In this video, find out what magnesium does for your brain and body, who is most likely to benefit from a supplement, what the evidence really says about magnesium and sleep, and whether I decided to buy any more. Magnesium is like the Swiss army knife of the mineral world. You name it, if it's important in the body and brain, magnesium probably helps to make it happen more efficiently. It's a cofactor or an activator in over 600 enzyme reactions. It helps maintain the normal function of our cells, enabling energy production, protein synthesis, DNA repair and replication. It's built into the infrastructure of bones and teeth. It enables nerve conduction and neurotransmitter synthesis, not just in the body, but also in the brain, facilitating learning, memory, and helping to moderate our stress response. It helps maintain healthy blood sugar levels and helps the heart beat regularly. It supports the immune system, decreasing harmful inflammation and reducing oxidative stress. So, Unsurprisingly, a lack of magnesium is a risk factor for the development and progression of a bunch of chronic illnesses, including diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, dementia, and even early mortality. So we all need magnesium. The body can't make it, we rely on what we eat. The good news is that magnesium is found in a lot of food. Rich sources include most foods with high fiber content leafy vegetables, legumes or pulses, nuts, seeds, avocados, bananas, kiwis, whole grains. It's also added to some cereals and mineral waters. Recommendations for how much magnesium we need vary a little by country, but it's around five to seven milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So at least 300 milligrams a day for women, 400 milligrams for men. You could get this with a bowl of shredded wheat with banana and milk for breakfast, a leafy avocado and tuna salad for lunch, an apple, a cheesy baked potato and baked beans for supper, with perhaps a Greek yogurt and blueberry chaser with a sprinkling of chia seeds. The body is really good at balancing our intake of magnesium with the amount we excrete from the body. Let's say we consume 360 milligrams in our diet, whether that's through meals or supplements. 30 to 40 percent will be absorbed as it travels through the small and large intestine, but more than half of it will be likely pooped out at the other end. So we could have around 100 milligrams, which makes its way into the body at least temporarily. Of this, only a tiny fraction, less than 1%, will be detectable in the blood as serum magnesium. The rest is soaked up and used within our cells. We store around 25 milligrams of magnesium in the body at any one time. 50 to 60% is in our bones and teeth, 30% in our muscles, and 10 to 20% is in the brain and other tissues. Any magnesium we don't need is filtered out by the kidneys and excreted in our urine. In this case, around 100 milligrams a day to maintain our balance. If you're generally healthy, it's highly unlikely that you will suffer from hypermagnesemia or too much magnesium. It does happen in kidney failure though, and signs include weakness, confusion, low breathing rate, poor reflexes, and cardiac arrest. Most of us don't need to worry about too much magnesium, but what about too little? Low levels of magnesium can be caused by putting too little in, not absorbing enough, or excreting too much. If you persistently eat a diet which is low in fibre and high in processed foods, over time this will put you at greater risk of a magnesium deficiency. Intriguingly, a recent UK analysis found that the magnesium content in fruit and vegetables is 10% lower than it was 80 years ago, so modern farming methods may not be giving us the same bang for our buck in terms of nutrient density as they used to. Chronic conditions such as diabetes, GI disorders and kidney problems will often upset the magnesium balance by unhelpfully altering absorption or excretion. Other factors that can lower magnesium retention include diets unusually high in sodium, calcium or protein, excessive caffeine or alcohol or both, and drugs. Even if you have a model diet, pregnancy, menopause and natural aging can all increase the risk of magnesium deficiency, and there's more. Research has shown that people who do a lot of endurance exercise are more likely to be short of magnesium. In fact, being exposed to any kind of chronic stressor may reduce our magnesium reservoir. A stressor is anything which fires up our fight or flight stress response, unleashing the physiological cascade which includes adrenaline and cortisol and is designed to prepare us for action. Exposure to many different types of stressors, exams, 
noise, cold and lack of sleep has been found to increase the rate of excretion of magnesium into the urine. Over time, chronic exposure to stress could increase the risk of magnesium deficiency. But hang on a minute, didn't we say earlier that we need magnesium to keep our stress response in check? Good point. Magnesium is a cofactor in a heap of stress-busting reactions, including the production and transmission of mood-boosting serotonin, activating calming GABA receptors, and reducing cortisol levels in the body. So if chronic stress lowers our stress-busting magnesium reserves, there is potential for a vicious cycle where the magnesium-deprived brain and body is then more susceptible to the damaging effects of stress. Low magnesium levels have been linked to depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. So maybe I should just get a blood test for magnesium. Hmm. Not so fast. Measuring magnesium in the blood is notoriously unreliable. Only 0.3% of the body's magnesium is in the blood serum. The vast majority of it is in the bones and tissues. Our bodies work so hard to maintain blood levels to within a narrow window, using the body's stores as a buffer, that you could have apparently healthy levels in the blood, which still mask a moderate to severe magnesium deficiency. For this reason, research studies will use food diaries over several days to estimate dietary magnesium intake. This is time consuming and relies on recall, which may not be accurate, but seems to be more closely linked to health outcomes than serum magnesium. So your best bet could be to keep a food diary for a few days and use online nutrient tables to tot up your magnesium intake. There are also tests which will measure magnesium in your red blood cells, urine or hair, or you could take a magnesium tolerance test, but these aren't routinely available. If you're of working age, you eat a generally healthy diet with plenty of whole foods and you don't have any GI or kidney issues, you've probably got a hearty stash of magnesium. But large-scale studies suggest that anything from 10 to 60% of adults are not getting enough magnesium in their diet. In the UK, we know that young people, the elderly, those from more deprived backgrounds and those with chronic conditions are at greatest risk of magnesium deficiency. Unfortunately, the symptoms of low magnesium are pretty non-specific and can easily be confused for chronic stress. Tiredness, irritability, anxiety or nervousness, GI spasms, muscle cramps, headache. Okay, so now that we know a bit more about magnesium, we're finally ready to answer the question I started with. Will taking a magnesium supplement improve your sleep? And in true scientific fashion, my answer is, it depends. If you've found any of my other videos, you'll know that I talk about three major systems which influence your sleep quality. In a nutshell, you want consistency to strengthen your circadian rhythms, you want to build up sleep pressure without letting stimulants interfere, and you'll need to convince the stress system that it's safe to switch off. Magnesium potentially has multiple soothing effects on the stress system, and it might help your circadian rhythm, but it's likely that a magnesium supplement will only help if you're correcting a deficiency. If you've noticed an immediate overnight benefit from a magnesium supplement, it may be because of the placebo effect. If you believe something will help you sleep, your anxiety about not being able to sleep reduces and you fall asleep faster and stay asleep for longer. This isn't necessarily a problem, it's great news, but it doesn't tell us whether magnesium is the active ingredient. For that, we need to compare the magnesium to a placebo in a randomized control trial. There have been a handful of this type of trial. A meta-analysis published in 2021 combined the results of three trials in 151 adults over the age of 55, so all quite small studies in older people. They found that on average, magnesium helped people fall asleep 17 minutes faster, but it didn't have consistent effects on sleep quality. The study that's often cited as evidence that magnesium definitely helps people sleep better gave 46 adults over 60 years of age 500 milligrams of magnesium as magnesium oxide for eight weeks compared to a placebo. Although they fell asleep more than 10 minutes faster after eight weeks, they still took over an hour to fall asleep at the end of the trial. Sleep quality improved significantly by two points on the insomnia severity index, but a change of six points would usually be recognized as a clinically significant improvement. In other words, things improved a bit, but not much. A more recent systematic review explored the effects of magnesium supplements on self-reported anxiety and sleep quality. They found that five out of eight studies reported sleep improvements, 
Two studies found no improvements and one had mixed results. The authors commented that most studies were small, some combined magnesium with other supplements like B6 or L-theanine, so it was hard to draw conclusions. But on the plus side, there were no adverse effects reported. The most frequent downside of some magnesium supplements is a laxative effect or even diarrhea. But this may be more of a problem with magnesium sulfate, citrate or oxide than more modern alternatives like glycinate. So in conclusion, am I going to buy more magnesium supplements? I'll be totally honest. After two months, I didn't notice any changes in my sleep or energy levels. I don't find the evidence for magnesium supplements for sleep very compelling for me, but I'm 43, generally healthy, and my sleep is pretty good. If I had diabetes, I was over the age of 55 and I was really struggling with my sleep, I would definitely check in with my doctor that it would be safe and probably give it a go. But I have to admit that while doing all this reading about magnesium, my overarching feeling is that it does a whole load of stuff that might not benefit sleep, but I definitely don't want to be magnesium deficient. It seems pretty indispensable for skeletal muscle integrity, energy production, limiting inflammation and protecting cells from oxidative stress. Going forwards, I will definitely be keeping an eye on my dietary magnesium intake and I will consider a supplement as an insurance policy if I think I'm not getting enough from my diet. I really hope you found this interesting. Please let me know in the comments if there is another sleep solution you'd like me to look into next. And do please subscribe if you'd like to stay up to date. Thanks for listening and sleep well.